Elon Musk has built himself an empire in the world of technology. His vision and foresight are so widely respected that a single tweet can make it or mar a company. How did he get there? He claims his work ethic blew through every obstacle he ever faced. Elon Musk does not work a regular week, like the rest of us. He's constantly on the go, yet finds time for a reasonable 6 hours of sleep and his family. How exactly does he balance two world acclaimed companies, a personal life, 5 teenage sons and a toddler? Stay until the very end to find out how Elon Musk runs through his days. Elon Musk is a notorious unbeliever in the 40 hour workweek. He has to run two industry giants Tesla and SpaceX and also serve as a co-founder to three other organizations, which basically serves as a side hustle. Putting that in perspective, you can rationalize his 80 to 90 hour work weeks. His role as frontman, engineer, designer and many others make it impossible for him to have a disorganized day. While some billionaires of his class rely on few hours of sleep each night to keep them efficient, Elon Musk has said that 6 hours is his sweet spot. His alarm goes off at 7am and he is up and out of bed, getting ready to attack his day with clarity. You can imagine that all that money he makes should avail him a delightful breakfast spread. It most likely could be Musk skips breakfast to get ahead in his day. He will most likely not even grab a cup of coffee and will hop in the shower. He claims that this daily shower has been the source of many splendid ideas. Before he gets his workday started, he spends at least 30 minutes checking and replying to what he refers to as critical emails. While we aren't completely certain about what he considers critical, we do know that they set the tone for what meetings he probably has each day, and also keeps him abreast of milestones achieved in major projects. The widespread case of the hardworking CEO is that he barely spends time with his family. Elon Musk found a creative way around this trouble. He does the school run for his boys every day. It might be a bit strange, but Musk has incorporated his children into his day and that allows them to build a good bond. Then again, the fact that his sons attend a school he co-founded and the fact that the school has a SpaceX campus does help out with his runs. So why would Elon Musk start a school? It seems that his biggest goal is to make things better, and that of course would include the educational system. Elon Musk was unimpressed with the standards of the US school system, and so he pulled all his sons out. He named the school he started Ad Astra, meaning to the stars. His curriculum consists of mathematics, engineering and ethics. Unlike most schools, there is no place for handwriting as computers are the prevalent tools and artificial intelligence forms a huge part of this school's focus. Since 2014 when he created the school, it has only grown to a student population of 30. Most of them are children of SpaceX employees and are highly gifted. The school now has a reputation for only accepting the biggest of brains. From over 100 applicants each year, only 10 to 12 are accepted. It looks like Elon Musk is passively shaping the future of his company's workforce. After school runs, Musk has to face his busy day. In the early days of Tesla and SpaceX, Musk worked up to 180 hours a week and could dedicate himself to sleeping on the floors of his territory, in his factory. In other words, there were times where I didn't leave the factory for 3 or 4 days, days where I didn't go outside. This has really come at the expense of seeing my kids and seeing friends. This lifestyle also gave him a few health troubles, so he had to learn to work a little bit smarter. Elon Musk usually has to split his time between Tesla and SpaceX, and he says that he spends Mondays and Fridays at SpaceX, then Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays at Tesla. When he's at SpaceX, he spends 90% of his time there working on engineering and design. When at Tesla, he spends 60% doing the same, and the rest is spent attending various board meetings. With his other companies, he shows up as and when needed. Musk says that one of the most efficient ways to plan one's day is to work in 5 minute slots. 5 minutes seems like a minuscule time block, but Musk says, Many people will be surprised at how much they could achieve in such a small amount of time if they give the task at hand 100% of their attention. His 5 minute rule also applies to his lunchtime. He scarfs down whatever he can reach in 5 minutes, usually during a meeting of sorts. His lunch can range from traditional breakfast foods like an omelette or salad. Musk is also a fan of fast food as he's known to indulge in a pizza now and again, but he doesn't seem to have much of an appetite or appreciation for food, seeing as how his only sit down meals are for dinner. Musk knows that his time is consumed by a lot of meetings, and his time is very precious to him. That is why in 2018, he created a few important rules for how meetings should go in his companies. The rules are, excessive meetings are the blight of big companies and almost always get worse over time. Please get rid of all large meetings, unless you're certain they are providing value to the whole audience, in which case, keep them very short. 
Also, get rid of frequent meetings, unless you're dealing with an extremely urgent matter. Meeting frequency should drop rapidly once the urgent matter is resolved. Walk out of a meeting or drop off a call as soon as it's obvious you aren't adding value. It is not rude to leave. It is rude to make someone stay and waste their time. In the same email that he sent to let his employees know about these rules, Musk also told his employees to avoid using acronyms or nonsense words for objects, software, or processes at Tesla, and encourage the free flow of information between all levels, no matter the employee's role or department. A slightly humorous part of Elon's day comes from his bathroom breaks. Musk says that he finds time spent answering nature's call to be a perfect time to do a little decompressing. Even then, he would still prefer to take a phone with him and answer whatever emails he has. It seems Musk is very uncomfortable with time spent doing mostly nothing. It's also interesting to note that getting Elon Musk to answer phone calls is an extremely futile activity. He sees phones as a tool to waste time on, and would much rather handle correspondence through email. His emails are sent to a super private email address to stop random people from reaching him. This allows him the ease of being able to only reply to essential mails. His after-work schedule is also as precisely detailed as that of his workday. It's probably a little difficult to go from being extremely busy to listlessly reclining on a couch, so Musk fills his after-work time with gym sessions and dinner plans. He would prefer to not work out if he had the choice, but his body needs to be kept fit after all that stress. He mostly sticks to lifting weights and running treadmills. He also loves getting into good books after work. Some of his favorites are The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, and Benjamin Franklin, An American Life by Walter Isaacson. Those are two very different genres, which just goes to show how diverse his tastes run. Musk has a neck-breaking schedule during the work week, but his weekends are very often free. He may spend a few hours at SpaceX on Saturdays if absolutely necessary, but his Sundays are his days to rest and refresh. Musk's definition of rest includes everything from watching anime to buying property. He's confessed to love watching anime like Death Note and Evangelion, which he watches with Grimes. His video game affection is a popular theme on his Twitter feed. He often plays them with his sons. He's been seen playing Overwatch and No Man's Sky. His popular 2017 tweet, A little red wine, vintage record, some Ambien, and magic, gives an idea of how he probably likes to spend his evenings. With a toddler around, we can imagine it would be much more rambunctious around the Musk home. A couple of years ago, Musk summed up how his work week went. Gwyn Shotwell is Chief Operating Officer. She kind of manages legal finances, sales, that kind of thing, general business activity, and then my time is almost entirely with the engineering team, working on improving the Falcon 9 and the Dragon spacecraft and developing the Mars colonial architecture. And then at Tesla, it's working on the Model 3, and some in the design studio, typically half a day a week, working with aesthetics and look and feel things. And then most of the rest of the week is just going through the engineering of the car itself, as well as the engineering of the factory, because the biggest epiphany I've had this year is the machine that builds the machine, the factory, and that is at least towards a magnitude harder than the vehicle itself. This was when Tesla was in the thick of the Model 3 creation. Now the Model 3 is one of the company's best sellers, and Musk still has not slowed down. With the kind of results he gets, it's not difficult to see why. Do you think the 48-year-old Elon Musk could keep this routine going smoothly? Let us know what you when the technology industry gained Elon Musk, it gained a great mind with a clear vision. Like most great minds, the legend has made some mind-boggling declarations that have had most people worried for him. The advent of his space exploration company saw Musk make more of these strong declarations and interestingly achieve most of them. No matter how long his track record of excellence gets, most people will not take his Mars agenda seriously until he actually accomplishes it. Musk wants to see Mars added to the Earth's rulership, and he's working very hard towards it. His new spacecraft, Starship, is already under production, and several prototypes have already been tested in the past year. What exactly does Musk aim to achieve with this determination to launch a thousand of these spacecraft to Mars at once? Stay with us on this video to find out, and don't forget to like and subscribe to enjoy more content. The future of humanity is going in two directions. Either it's going to become multiplanetary, or it's going to remain confined to one planet, and eventually there's going to be an extinction event. This is a sentiment that Elon Musk subscribes to. It was also the reason why he felt the need to create SpaceX, a company almost completely dedicated to creating spacecraft for humanity's exploration in space. Starship and its rocket booster, Super Heavy, had been under development at a SpaceX facility in a small southern Texan town of Boca Chica. Starship has also got multiple prototypes tested, the most recent being the SN11. Some have been fairly successful, while others, like the SN10, 
went down in a blaze of epic proportions. The final version of the Starship was actually the most powerful rocket in the world, because it's going to combine the super heavy rocket booster to launch crewed missions to the moon and ultimately Mars. The Saturn V rocket that took NASA's crew on the Apollo missions will be nothing compared to what the Super Heavy can do. It's got 28 next generation Raptor engines that give a thrust that rivals Saturn V's. Starship will also be able to carry a remarkable payload of 100 metric tons, which will be helpful when Elon Musk plans to convey materials needed to build his dream city on Mars. Super Heavy will hurl Starship to low Earth orbit and land back to be reused as Starship embarks on a voyage to the Moon or Mars. This ability to be reused will be Super Heavy's ace in the spacecraft world. SpaceX has reported that Starship itself will be powered by six Raptor engines, three vacuum optimized engines for propulsion in space, and three sea level engines for atmospheric flight. Musk has also set targets for when his Martian city will be up and running. He intends to have the colony ready for establishment in 2028. He can only achieve this goal if he can get enough materials to the Red Planet when he launches the Starship. Earth and Mars are at their closest every 26 months, and that's the perfect opportunity for anyone to land anything on the planet's surface. His first mission was scheduled to launch in 2022, but this looks very improbable because of technological delays. Hopefully the mission will launch in 2024, and then a crewed mission will follow in 2026. For the astronauts to have a shot at surviving on Mars, some measures have to be put in place. This means having about 100,000 tons of supplies which have to be launched alongside the crewed missions, but all before it. How does Elon Musk plan to do this? For him, it's actually pretty simple. Launch 1,000 Starships at once. Production is hard. Prototypes are easy. Building around 1,000 Starships to create a self-sustaining city on Mars is our mission," Musk said in a tweet last year. Building one Starship has not been an easy feat, so one starts to wonder how Musk plans to get his 1,000 ships ready. SpaceX could build 100 Starships per year for the next 10 years to be able to meet up, but launching them all at once seems like a shot in the dark. A Starship fleet of 100 could launch to Mars when the Earth and Mars orbits align to each other. Building 100 Starships in 10 years gets to 1000 in 10 years, or 100 megatons a year, or maybe around 100k people per Earth-Mars orbit sync," Musk explained in January this year. Musk just might be able to achieve this goal of 100 starships in two years. In two years, as in the last three months, SpaceX launched three full-sized prototypes of its 165-foot tall rockets. His progress with SpaceX even before this has been spectacular. Musk started with SpaceX as far back as 2002, after he sold off PayPal. His initial idea, after seeing the lack of interest in Mars exploration, was to send a greenhouse that contained dehydrated nutrient gels to Mars. The gel would then be rehydrated to start growing small plants when it arrived at Mars. Musk's idea was that this would be the furthest life has ever traveled. The best thing is that this would have been able to get the world more excited about space and maybe provide us with some pictures of Mars. This launch never happened. Instead, Elon Musk discovered the gap that existed in the large area of rocket design. Rockets are very expensive vehicles. The cheapest one for the US is $65 million. Musk would have needed two rockets for his greenhouse launch. That was when Musk decided to focus on improving rocket science and engineering and making it a lot more cost efficient. The company has done it countless times with satellites that have launched which have threatened to end its mission. Musk chose to never give up on it. SpaceX had a plan to launch 39 rockets in 2020 and they succeeded in launching 26 which is pretty impressive given how tumultuous 2020 was. Two of SpaceX's launches last year sent astronauts to the ISS, aboard SpaceX Crew Dragon capsules, the first orbital crewed missions to lift off from the United States since NASA grounded its space shuttle fleet in 2011. Some of the launches were for SpaceX to carry some of its Starlink internet satellites. These satellites are designed to form the company's super-fast broadband service. And this project will get SpaceX reaching as far as Australia with affordable internet. This venture is estimated to bring in $22 billion in profit per annum by 2025. This just might be what breaks SpaceX away from the dependence on outside investors. The USA FCC has at some point suggested that they would give SpaceX ION in subsidies. This would go towards Musk company providing internet in rural areas around the world. The US military has also given Musk's company a deal to replicate Starlink's design in demonstration satellites. Ironically, SpaceX has only won 40% of the USA's security launches. 
The remaining 60% has mostly been awarded to the United Launch Alliance, which is a joint venture of Boeing and Lockheed. Not one of ULA's private missions was launched last year, while SpaceX already had its Falcon 9 rocket to carry out its own launches. ULA hasn't done a full ground test of its new rocket, Vulcan, which is set to begin work in 2021. Where SpaceX is at the moment is due to Musk's steady push forward, because, at several points, the company has been at the point of folding up. One of the most notable points was back in 2008, when SpaceX's Falcon 1 finally launched into lower Earth orbit. This was six years after the company's launch, and it was at the point at which the company started to be taken seriously after its three previous failed attempts to launch. If that fourth launch had failed, SpaceX would have been unable to prove that its homegrown, super-efficient kerosene oxygen Merlin rocket motor could power a rocket into orbit. Nine of these motors would have been needed in the powering of the rocket that would carry payloads for clients like NASA. The Falcon 9 became the cash cow for SpaceX, and it would have never existed if that fourth launch had ended up in an explosion. Musk has a unique style of leadership that aims to avoid making his engineers sit down with papers for years and never get to work on any actual projects. This is why he would rather launch tests that crash rather than try to play it safe. This is in a way a sign of trust in the intelligence of the people he hires. The man takes recruiting to new heights. In Liftoff, a book written about SpaceX's early days by Eric Berger, some of Musk's recruiting lengths is revealed. One time he got in touch with Google co-founder Larry Page to ask if a senior Google staffer could work from a Los Angeles office instead of a Silicon Valley one so that the staffer's spouse could work for SpaceX. Page agreed. Musk's goal, according to Berger, is very clear. His relentless quest is to get humans to Mars as soon as possible. This means two things, a laser-like focus on hiring the smartest engineers and adopting ultra-fast engineering techniques. This singular focus has given SpaceX an edge in the market of commercial space launches because Elon Musk has cut down a lot of the cost for his clients. This is to get that Starship's engineering technique is supposed to pay off, with a crude launch. This will most likely be a trip around the Moon and Mars. The Starship has made so much progress with all of its testings, but until now, we had heard nothing about the Super Heavy. The reusable rocket booster stands proud at 230 feet tall. On March 18th, Musk shared a picture of the first one on Twitter. The booster was seen inside its assembly building at SpaceX's test facility in Boca Chica, Texas. Booster 1 is a production pathfinder figuring out how to build and transport a 70-meter tall stage. Booster 2 will fly, Musk shared via Twitter. SpaceX's Super Heavy is designed to come right back down to Earth for a vertical landing. The power in the booster is needed to push the ship off of the Earth's large surface, but the ship can get off Mars or the Moon by itself as the bodies are smaller. SpaceX also has a mission schedule for 2023. Japanese billionaire Yusaku Maezawa has commissioned a mission with Starship to fly humans and other artists around Mars and the Moon. This will be the first commercial passenger spaceflight, and it has many people questioning the place of passenger travel in space. Starship prototype launches have had a little bit of trouble with the US FCC due to some fears about danger. The SN11 launch did not receive approval the first time SpaceX wanted it to happen, even though the vessel was already fueled and ready to go. The launch eventually happened, but still ended in an explosion right before touchdown. Is this an indication of how far ready the Starship is to launch? Can one mission happen this year? If not, then how does SpaceX plan to prepare to launch a thousand of the ships? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. SpaceX has changed the game of building rockets by building their entire factory around their prototypes, turning Boca Chica into the wild west of rocketry. In this video, we'll be exploring the differences between the Starship and the Falcon 9. Do watch this video until the end, and don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. In terms of the rocket engines of both space vehicles, the Falcon 9 has nine Merlin 1D engines in the very first stage, and just one vacuum-optimized Merlin MVAC in the second stage. These Merlin engines are open cycle, which means they have a smaller sized rocket engine referred to as a gas generator. The exhaust from this generator is used to spin a turbine, which drives the main propellant pumps. With the sea level Merlin, the exhaust is hurled overboard. However, the vacuum engine in the second stage moves the gas through the nozzles, so as to provide a layer of cooler gas that will keep the extended nozzle from melting. For the Starship, a whole new rocket engine was invented. SpaceX went on to develop a full-flow staged combustion cycle engine, known as the Raptor. The Raptor is a very complex engine, because 
The exhaust gas, which would usually be dumped overboard after spinning the turbine, is transferred to the main combustion chamber and used for thrust. Apart from this fact, there are two other little rocket engines that have their own turbines and pumps. One of these engines is rich in fuel, while the other is rich in oxygen, and the exhausts are also pumped into the main combustion chamber. As the fuel and the oxygen arrive in the combustion chamber, the hot gas is produced, and it increases the efficiency largely. The Raptor is one of the most advanced rocket engines in the world at the moment, and is still going through development. The Orbiter version of the Starship is built to have six Raptors, three sea level and three largest vacuum optimized engines. The Super Heavy booster will eventually carry over 25 engines. Since the engines are relatively small, many of them can be squeezed at the bottom of the rocket. The fuels of both the Starship and the Falcon 9 also differ. The Falcon 9 runs on rocket-grade kerosene popularly known as RP-1 and liquid oxygen LOX, which forms a combustion called Kerolox. In the case of the Starship, the Raptor engines run on liquid methane and liquid oxygen, also known as Methalox. Liquid methane has the advantage of being cleaner than RP-1 as it doesn't leave any soot in the engine. Liquid methane can also be more efficient, even though it is not as dense as the RP-1, making the tanks a bit larger in volume. Other consumables on the Falcon 9 Inside the smaller tanks of the Falcon 9, there are three more consumables, which make the Falcon 9 a lot more complex than the Starship. The three consumables are 1. Helium Each tank in the Falcon 9 holds a set of composite overwrapped pressure vessels COPVs. These black cylinders have compressed helium with a pressure of over 380 bar. These highly pressurized tanks maintain the pressure in the propellant tanks. Whenever the, the fuel is drained, helium is used to replace it, and this keeps the propellant flowing. Starship is not going to have any use for such tanks at all. This is because after landing on Mars, it won't be so easy to refill the helium tank. The Starship will rather use methane, which can be produced on the surface. Starship's mechanism will be different, as the propellant tanks will simply be pressurized autogenously. This means that the engine are still running and they will also be pumping some gaseous fuel and oxidizer back into their individual tanks. The pressure will be maintained by allowing some of the fuel to boil and releasing all excess pressure. In this way, the temperature will be maintained as the boil-off cools the fuel. 2. TTEB The second thing that the Falcon 9 has which Starship lacks is the ignition fluid. The Falcon 9 makes use of TTEB, trithalborane. This mixture is said to be pyrophoric. That is, it ignites without a spark when oxygen comes into contact with it. Once the Falcon 9 pumps are spinning up, TTEB is injected into the combustion chamber, and combustion starts while fuel is being poured into it, before it enters a stable combustion state. This mixture is very important for the Merlin engines to be able to restart. If the fluid is not present, the engines will not be able to reignite. Just as there will be no need for the helium tanks on the Starship, the Starship uses a spark ignition. This is a sort of giant spark plug that starts the ignition process. Nitrogen Another propellant used in the Falcon 9 is compressed nitrogen. This is actually compressed air. Compressed nitrogen is also used for the cold gas thrusters on the Falcon 9 interstage. Two packs of four little thrusters sit on the booster stage and are used to flip it around as the boosters coast before re-entry. For the Starship, only one main propellant has to be transported. So Starships will use hot gas thrusters which will be powered by boiled off methane and oxygen gas. In essence, the different fuels and cycle types contribute to Starship's upgraded performance compared to the Falcon 9. It is also important that we take a look at the performance of both the Falcon 9 and the Starship and how they compare in different areas. The Merlin engine on the Falcon 9 is able to reach a wonderful amount of thrust at 845 kN and 981 kN in a vacuum. However, the Raptor engine in its beginning stages can run at about 1,650 kN at sea level and can achieve around 1,800 kN in a vacuum. The Merlin is quite efficient, with 282 seconds of impulse at sea level and 311 seconds in a vacuum. The Raptor, however, is a lot more efficient and can achieve about 325 seconds at sea level and almost 350 seconds in a vacuum. Chamber Pressure a lot of the great performance from the Starship is because of the chamber pressure inside the main combustion chamber. Once the chamber pressure is higher, it means that the engines are giving more thrust and getting more efficient. 
the Merlin achieves 116 bar of pressure, while the Raptor is operationally at around 275 bar currently, but has hit the 330 bar on the test stand and will soon be up to 350 bar, which is the goal for SpaceX. There is one more area that Merlin currently outperforms the Raptor. The Raptor may not be able to beat the Merlin engine because it has the highest thrust to weight ratio of any liquid fueled rocket engine ever. Also, the Merlin engine has a thrust to weight ratio of around 200 to 1, while the Raptor currently has around 107 to 1, but increasing to 130 to 1. Of course, Elon Musk still believes that they'll be able to catch up with the Merlin. Size and Construction Starship is very large compared to the Falcon 9, which is actually a decent sized rocket, and it's really hard to appreciate how big it actually is until you're standing underneath it. The Starship is 9 meters in diameter, while the Falcon 9 is 3.7. The Falcon 9 stands at 70 meters tall, with this first stage at 45 meters tall, while the second stage and the nose cone take up the space of the other 25. The super heavy booster will stand at over 75 meters tall. Then put the Starship up a stage on top of the super heavy booster and the entire stack will stand at 122 meters tall. That's over 10 meters taller than the monster Saturn V. Think of the massive size in addition to their different engines with different performance figures and different fuels, and what it translates to is Starship can put so much more weight into orbit. The Falcon 9 can take 22,800 kilograms into LEO when expanded, or 15,600 kilograms when reused, as it does for the Starlink missions. It can send 8,300 kilograms into geostationary transfer orbit when expended, or about 7,000 kilograms when reused. Falcon Heavy can also get about 25,000 kilograms into geostationary transfer orbit when fully expended. It can also get about 13,000 kilograms when doing the two times RTLS, one times drone ship landing. But Starship will soon be able to take over 150,000 kilograms up into LEO. Yes, that will be more payload mass than any other rocket ever made, even beating the Saturn V, which could only put 145,000 kilograms into LEO. It will do this while still being fully reusable. Starship can also put a solid 21,000 kilograms into geostationary transfer orbit, despite having to lug its own huge dry mass out there. This is lower than what you can put in an expendable Falcon Heavy, but expending a super heavy booster comes with a whole lot more space. However, expending a super heavy booster is not part of the plan. Since the whole rocket is reusable, Starship has to take its heavy flaps, landing gear, the payload fairing, and all six engines with it where it goes. Starship makes up for that with its orbital refueling. If Starship is refueled with just one tanker, it can get that GTO payload capacity right back up to that 150,000 kilogram mark. And if you refuel it enough, it can take 150,000 kilograms all the way to the moon or Mars. This simply changes everything. Payload. Another huge upgrade for the Starship is its massive payload. The Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy share the same bearing, which is about 5 meters wide and 14 meters tall, with a total reusable volume of 145 cubic meters. Despite being able to take almost 10 times as much payload into orbit as the Falcon 9, Starship should cost less than the Falcon 9 to launch. Given that it's a fully reusable rocket, it should basically only be the cost of fuel and personnel time. But we're talking potentially way less than Falcon 9. SpaceX is hoping it'll cost less to launch than a Falcon 1 even. In fact, it very well might end up being the cheapest ride to orbit. We fully expect Starship will have some stumblings along the way. And some valuable lessons will be learned too. There'll likely be more explosions along the path to orbit, and even once in operation. Remember, the Falcon 9 history has not always been smooth sailing either. Thank you for watching this video and while you're here, go ahead and click on one of these videos on your screen right now to enjoy some more juicy information waiting for you. See you there!